turn, if you will, to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. And again, we're picking up what we looked at last week in relation to Noah's flood. This is part two. And as I mentioned to you, you'll notice the diagram up on the screen. If you look at chapter 6 all the way to chapter 9, you're really dealing with one unit of thought. Chapter 6 is dealing with the pre-flood. When you get into 7 and 8, you're dealing with the flood. And then finally, when you get into chapter 9, you're dealing with post-flood conditions. We're in chapter 6, and really what chapter 6 is doing pre-flood is it's giving us the reasons why or the reason why the flood was actually sent by God. And we know from Genesis chapter 6, the reason was man's wickedness upon the earth. In fact, sin started off as a tumor in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned, and what happened over time was that tumor, that cancer, began to metastasize, and it got to such a point where God had to cut out the tumor, as it were, when He sent the worldwide flood. Now, let me read what we looked at last time just to set the setting as we go into chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, and I'm reviewing here. It says, when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. And we talked about how these fallen angels, these demons cohabitated with women, tried to produce a demon-human race and basically destroy the messianic line. And so God, one of the reasons He destroyed that uh, pre-flood civilization was because of this type of union. Then the Lord said in verse 3, My spirit will not always contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. So the Nephilim would be the product of this union between women and demons. The Lord saw, verse 5, how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. And so evil really dominated the society in which they lived. The Lord regretted or was sorry that He had made human beings on the earth, and His heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with the, them the animals and the birds and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. He walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. Now this is where we pick up in verse 14. Here's what God instructed Noah to do because he was going to send this global catastrophe. He said, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. And so God is going to preserve Noah in this particular ark, and He's going to tell him specifically what to do. Now, He basically says, you are to make an ark of gopher wood. What is gopher wood? Well, I think this picture here sums it up. You'll see here, uh, this does not qualify as gopher wood. Now, what is gopher wood? Well, here is some pictures that they think may have been the wood that they used. It could have been pine. It could have been cypress wood. It could have been another type of wood. We're really not sure. We can't be dogmatic what this gopher wood was, but it was very, very strong, and it was very, very sturdy. And then it also says in the text here that he was to make many rooms within the ark. Now, what are these rooms? You'll notice a picture up on the screen. The actual Hebrew word means nests. And here's what it looks like. They were kind of like these little cubicles here that Noah was able to put the animals upon. And some people raise the question, well, if all these animals went on the ark, 
How could the heart contain all these particular animals? And this one particular author said this about the rooms that were established in the ark and whether or not the ark was sufficient enough to house Noah, his family, and all the animals. He said this, and I quote, based on two-thirds of the total available square footage of the ark, or 64,500 square feet, and taking 25% of the remaining space for stores leaves 48,375 square foot for passengers, allowing 80 square foot per a family of four or 20 square foot per person, the average size of eight by 10 two-man prison cell, and dividing by that number yields about 605 living spaces. And so he sums it up by saying with all that math, I'm not a mathematician, but he says this, at four people per space, that comes to 2,420 total passengers. That's how many people could have been on the ark, and he says that's more than sufficient to actually house all the animals. And so God knew exactly what he was doing. And then he also says in this verse, in verse 14, that he was to actually cover inside and outside the ark with pitch. Now, we know the word pitch here refers to tree sap. Some people think it's oil, but really oil was post-flood because you know where oil comes from. It comes from living organisms that have been killed, that have been buried under the ground. That's where we get a lot of our oil from, from dinosaur fossils, maybe even humans or whatever else. That's where oil comes from. We know for a fact that when you squeeze animals, what happens is it produces oil. And so skeptics will say, well, wait a minute. If Noah covered the ark with pitch, he covered it with oil. I thought you Christians say that oil came after the flood in the fossil record. Well, actually, the word here for pitch is the word tree resin. It's a resin that he used. In fact, we know that sailors would use this on their ships even back in the 1800s where they would use this tree sap or this turpentine material that they would get from trees, and it served as a covering, and what it would do is it would waterproof the ship. Now, what's interesting is the word here for pitch is the word covering, and when you get to the root of the word, it actually means atonement. What does the word atonement mean? Well, we talk about the atonement of Christ, and so there's terminology here just as Noah covered the ship with pitch, it was a covering to keep out the water. Jesus Christ, the New Testament says, is our atonement. He is our covering. And when you and I are covered with the blood of Jesus Christ, as it were, the Bible says we are preserved from the water of God's wrath. And so he picks up again in verse 15 of Genesis 6. Here's what he tells Noah to do. This is how you shall make it. Here are the dimensions, the specs. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make, verse 16, a window for the ark, and that may have been to let water in so that they would have water, and finish it to a cubit from the top, and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Now again, we want to have visuals here to understand what we're talking about. So if you look at this here, here was the size of the ark compared to a football field. It actually is longer than a football field. It's a football field and a half. It was 450 feet in length. That's the dimensions they are using cubits. It was 75 feet high, and it was 45 feet in width. That was the size of the ark. Now, to give you a comparison, go to the next slide. You'll notice here different ships. This is the Santa Maria. This is the Wyoming. This is the Titanic. This is Queen Mary. And so you will see here Noah's Ark in comparison to what's going on up here. So it was, for that time, it was a pretty large ship. And as I said, the dimensions of the ship, most people that have researched this said it was exactly what it needed to be. And it was sort of a rectangular shaped ship which would allow it to have floated on the water exactly so that the ship would not break up. So God knew exactly what the specs needed to be. Next slide. You'll notice here he said that the ship was to have three decks on it. And you could see up here, they think it was the bird coverage. Here was for food storage. And here was 
uh, the animal area where the animals were shipped here. There were three decks here, and of course, here is the roof that covered the actual ark. Next slide. Here is actually a living model of what it would look like. And then if you go to the one final slide here, you'll notice this is a life-size ark in Kentucky. I mentioned to you that Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis, his ministry, which by the way, you could get on his website, he deals a lot with this stuff in terms of what happened in Genesis with the ark, uh, the table of nations. A lot of the questions that you may have, you could go to his website and he's going to get into a lot of those uh, questions and give you some solid answers. But in Kentucky, they actually built this amusement park. And uh, I mentioned to you and Jess last time about getting a group to go, but we ought to get a group to go. If you're interested in heading that up, we could uh, actually drive there, take a bus, maybe spend the night or two, and then look at this exhibit. I read just recently that they had over this past year a million visitors. And so it's starting to pick up steam. Uh, but they have animals there, and they give you a lot of history of the ark. And so that gives you an idea of the size of the ark and its dimensions. Now, in verse 17, it says, Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. Have you noticed in Hebrew Scripture, it's very, very repetitive they do that for emphasis. But God says to Noah, in spite of the fact that I'm going to destroy the world, I, verse 18, am going to establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And so in spite of the fact that God was going to destroy everybody on the planet, God made a covenant with Noah because Noah had a genuine relationship with God. Now, the Bible talks about a lot of covenants. In fact, one of the ways that God works with mankind is through covenants. Now, there's not a covenant mentioned in the book of Genesis back in the Garden of Eden, but all of the elements of a covenant are there. And so we would say the first covenant would be the Adamic covenant, where God gave stipulations. And remember, a covenant's kind of an agreement. And there's two types of covenants. There is a unilateral covenant that's where God determines the terms, and he says, here's what I'm going to do. And it's not dependent upon that person as to whether or not God fulfills the covenant. It's unilateral. It comes directly from God, and God fulfills it. Then there is a bilateral covenant. What is a bilateral covenant? That's when God enters into a covenant with people, but they have certain conditions that they must meet as well. And so with Adam, you have a bilateral covenant. With Noah, do you have a unilateral or bilateral? It's a unilateral covenant. And what's the covenant? God says he will never destroy the earth again by water. Look at this slide right here. You will notice in the Noahic covenant, it was for all of mankind. It was a promise of God's abiding love and mercy never to destroy the creation by water or by a flood. That was a unilateral covenant. And God gave a symbol, as you know, the rainbow in order to seal the covenant. Typically, when God would make a covenant, he would seal it. You say, well, what are the other covenants? Well, you have the Adamic covenant. You have the Noahic covenant. Then when we get to Genesis chapter 12, we're going to have the Abrahamic covenant, which was a unilateral covenant. Then you're going to get to the Mosaic covenant, which is a bilateral covenant. Israel had to obey if God was going to bless them. Then you're going to get to 2 Samuel 7. You have the Davidic covenant, where he told David that, David would never cease to have a descendant on the throne. He would have an eternal dynasty. And you know Jesus came from David's line. And then finally, look at this next slide. You and I enter into, not this one right here, but go to the next one. We enter into the new covenant. Jesus made the new covenant. Remember in the Gospels? On the night he celebrated the Passover. And what is the new covenant? The new covenant says this. If you're willing to trust in Jesus, God will forgive you of all your sins, and he'll write his laws on your heart, and the Holy Spirit will come to live on the inside of you to help you fulfill the law of God. That is the new covenant. Now, with the Noahic covenant, God said he would never destroy the earth again by fire, water, but go back to the other slide. You'll notice here in 2 Peter chapter 3, we all know this, it says there that God will incinerate this earth. 
There's going to be one big conflagration in the end where God is going to uncreate the universe. He's going to split the atoms, as it were, and he's going to uncreate this universe, and he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. So there is coming a fiery holocaust upon this earth. People ask me if I believe in global warming, and I tell them yes. I believe in this type of global warming right here because God is going to warm up this earth, and he's going to burn it up, and he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And so in verse 19, and of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Now, why is God telling them to do this? Well, obviously, when they get off the ark, there's going to need to be a repopulation. And so in verse 20, of the birds after their kind and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing on the ground after its kind, two of every kind will come to you and keep them alive. Remember in Genesis, in the earlier chapters, it talked about how animals reproduced after their own kind. You see, that's a death blow to the view of macroevolution, because macroevolution teaches that one kind can become a whole different other kind. And the Bible never says that. The Bible says there are variations within a kind. You can have the original dog the original coyote, as it were, and from that comes a whole different variety of dogs. But listen, a dog does not become a cat. One kind does not become another kind because it's built into the genetic structure. There are genetic limitations. And so God says here, I want you to bring animals, I want you to bring birds, every creeping thing on the ground, Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. Notice Noah didn't have to figure it out. They came to Noah, and Noah was to separate them, probably. Verse 21, as for you, take for yourself some of all food, which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Now, we don't know exactly what food he brought, but we can speculate because it wasn't until after the flood that God sanctioned the eating of meat. So what do you think the food was here? Vegetables, fruit. And so Noah brought this on the ark, and God is basically saying, I'm going to bring a disaster, and I want you to have a supply of food. I want you to prepare yourself. Remember in Genesis when God was going to send famine on the land? What did he tell Joseph to do? He said, during the years of plenty, you need to stockpile. And by the way, this is a good principle for us. There are some people that get hyper with this, and there are those uh, doomsday preppers. You ever seen that show before where people will start to prep, and they're really obsessed with this. On the other hand, I think it's a wise principle that you and I prepare for the future. It's good to save. I have at least, I probably shouldn't tell you this because if we have a food shortage, you're going to come to my house, but I have about a six-month supply of food that I have military meals. Over the years, I've purchased them in the case of an emergency. I have a six-month supply probably of toiletries. Why? Because if there's ever an economic downturn, I have something in supply. And you know, a lot of Christians are going to get off, caught off guard if something happens. Now, I'm not a doomsday guy, and I'm not saying tomorrow things are going to fall apart. But listen, it's good to have reasonable preparation. God tells them here, go ahead and prepare for this disaster. Thus, verse 22, Noah did. According to all that God had commanded him, so he did. And this is why Noah was a righteous man, because he had faith in God. And watch this, one of the evidences of Noah's faith was he is a man of obedience. You see, obedience is one of the marks of a person of genuine faith. A person who says they trust in Jesus Christ, they're born again, and you don't see any evidence of obedience in their life as a lifestyle, you have to question their profession. And the reason I bring that out is because we have easy believism in the American church. There are many people that profess faith in Jesus Christ, but they have zero fruit. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7? When people stand before him, he said, many will say to him on that day, what's the words? Lord, Lord. And Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. And Jesus says, the one who does the will of God. You see, that's the issue. And so if you have a family member, a coworker, a friend, maybe a child, 
who says, oh, I believe in Jesus, I'm saved. They don't go to church, they don't read their Bible, they're living in a lifestyle of sin. You know what God wants you and I to do in love? He wants us to rattle their cage spiritually. Don't be nasty, don't be judgmental and self-righteous, but you know what God wants you to do? He wants you to challenge their faith and say, hey, maybe you're not really saved. See, we're not doing people a favor if we give them a false assurance of their salvation. If you want to read the book of 1 John, 1 John gives three tests to determine whether or not you're a Christian. I call it the DOC test, D-O-C. You know, you go to the doctor, you get a test. You know what the three tests are? There's the doctrinal test, the obedience test, and the Cupid test. Cupid, yeah, love. Because he says if you don't love your brother, you're not born of God. You have the doctrinal test, the obedience test, and the Cupid test. You see, those are the tests to demonstrate the reality of your faith. And Noah was that kind of person. Now, in verse 20, all the way to verse 21, he mentions about bringing different kinds upon the boat. What do we mean by kinds here? Because skeptics have said there's no way that Noah could have brought all these animals on the boat. You say, time out. Let's define what we mean by kinds. Now, notice the chart here with our modern taxonomy. This is how we classify animals today in biology class. When the Bible talks about kinds, he's not talking about species. He's not saying bring every species on the boat. He's talking about probably in the area of family. You say, well, isn't that impossible? Well, one guy said this in talking about the kinds. You'll notice up on the screen, and I think this will help you understand it. Here's what he said, and I quote, when we understand that Noah needed to bring kinds of animals and not species, and we eliminate all of the sea creatures, plants, and possibly, possible, uh, possibly insects from the millions of species, it becomes clear that the number of animals required to be on the ark is much lower than the skeptics claim. A detailed study in the 1990s by Dr. John Wood, I won't pronounce his name, used worst case scenario estimates to calculate that fewer than 8,000 kinds would have been on board the ship. Over the past several years, some creationist researchers have been involved in extensive study of the original animal kinds and their estimates is even lower, less than 2,000 kinds of animals that would need to be on board. Admittedly, admittedly, only an estimate, since many of the original kinds have gone extinct and are only known today from the fossil record. Also, we do not have sufficient data regarding every type of creature on earth today to ascertain all of the original kinds, end quote. And so you see from what he's saying here that probably there was as many as 8,000, as low as 2,000 that were actually brought upon the boat. And so we know that the ark was sufficient in size in order to bring these animals upon it, to bring some birds, to bring some crawling creatures in order to repopulate the earth post-flood. Well, now we go to chapter 7, verse 1, and it says this. How am I doing on time? Because... These screens are, all right, 752. Verse 1, it says this, Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. And so earlier in chapter 6, he instructs Noah to prepare the ark. He gives him the dimensions. He tells him what to bring on the ark. And now, in verse 1 of chapter 7, he tells Noah to actually enter the ark. Now, when we look at this symbolically, we know from the New Testament, particularly 1 Peter chapter 3, that the ark is symbolic of Jesus Christ. The floodwaters represent symbolically God's judgment. And so, there is a picture here. God prepared the ark. The ark is Jesus Christ. And if you read the book of Hebrews, it says there that God prepared a body for Jesus. Jesus is the ark, as it were, and God prepared Jesus to come to this earth to die on the cross and rise from the dead. But here's the key. The Bible says it's one thing to know about the ark. 
It's another thing to enter the ark. You see, Noah built the ark, but then God said, you got to enter the ark. And if Jesus Christ is the ark symbolically, you and I, in order to be saved from the floodwaters of God's judgment, we must enter the ark. It's not enough to know about the ark. We must enter the ark in order to be saved. And isn't it interesting that Noah was the only person in his generation that was saved? And that's remarkable because that shows us how evil the earth had become. But here is a principle. God always has a remnant that he preserves. Because if God did not preserve Noah, the promise of Genesis 3.15 would not have been fulfilled. And just to remind you of that promise, Genesis 3.15, God promises right after Adam and Eve sinned, that he would send someone to crush the head of Satan. And we know ultimately that is the first prophecy of Jesus Christ the Messiah. And so if God did not make a covenant with Noah, he did not preserve Noah, there would be no fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. And so God always has a remnant. You remember when Israel had fallen into idolatry and Elijah had complained to God and he said, oh, I'm the only one who is worshiping you. And God says, no, I have preserved 7,000 Israelites who have not bowed the knee to Baal. You see, God has always preserved. And listen, you and I are the remnant. Do you realize that there are 7 billion plus people on this planet and God has called you to salvation? It's like my friend used to say to me, I've won the lottery. Now, you and I know it's not the lottery because it's not chance, but you and I are chosen by God. We are God's remnant, and God has preserved us for a particular purpose. And I don't know about you, but I feel a sense of destiny. I feel a sense of calling. And the older I get, I want to fulfill the destiny that God has put on my life. How about you? Listen, if you're going through life just working, coming home, watching TV, and nothing wrong with working and watching TV. But if your existence is simply to eke out a living and basically go to bed and do the same thing day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, with no sense of purpose, listen, you got to get into the Word of God and discover your purpose because you are God's remnant. And God has a purpose for you in this time. And so in verse 2, he says, You shall take with you, and here he's going to get repetitive again, just for the sake of emphasis, every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female, also of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. You see, God wanted to preserve the animals after the flood. For after seven more days, verse 4, I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights. And I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. And again, we see Noah's obedience. Noah did, verse 5, according to all that the Lord had commanded him. And so what God told him here to do was, I want you to take seven pairs of clean animals and birds, and I want you to take two pairs of unclean animals. Now, why did God have him do this? Well, as I mentioned, to repopulate the earth Also, this was for sacrifice following the flood. That's why God had him take seven pairs of clean animals as opposed to two pairs of unclean animals, was because there would be enough for sacrifice when he got off the ark and probably for food. Now, what were these clean and unclean animals? Because later on, when you get into Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14, in the Mosaic law, God there makes a distinction between clean and unclean animals. You don't see it in Genesis. It's not clearly defined. It's just mentioned here. And by the way, Noah, I mean, Moses wrote the book of Genesis. And so when Moses wrote the book of Genesis, he had this idea of clean and unclean animals. What were the unclean and clean animals? Well, here's what one author states, and this will give you an idea as you go to Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And here's the quote. God states that the cud-chewing animals with split hooves can be eaten. These specifically include the cattle, the sheep, goat, deer, and gazelle families. He also lists such animals as camels, rabbits, pigs as being unclean, 
or unfit to eat. He later lists such creeping things as moles, mice, lizards, as unfit to eat, as well as four-footed animals with paws, cats, dogs, bears, lions, and tigers, as unclean. He tells us that salt and freshwater fish with fins and scales may be eaten, but water creatures without those characteristics, catfish, lobster, crab, shrimp, mussels, clams, oyster, squid, octopi, should not be eaten. God also lists birds and other flying creatures that are unclean for consumption. He identifies carrion eaters and birds of prey as unclean, plus ostrich, storks, herons, and bats. Birds such as chickens, turkeys, and pheasants are not on the unclean list and therefore can be eaten. Insects, with the exception of locusts, crickets, and grasshoppers, are listed as unclean, end quote. So you get an idea there. Now, here's the good news. We're not under these dietary laws anymore, right? So you can eat all the bacon you want to eat. You can eat a lot of the shellfish. We're not under these dietary laws. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus did away with them. And so that's good news. And so that gives you an idea of the clean and unclean animals that he brought on the ship, seven clean and two unclean. Well, in verse 4 of Genesis 7, it says, For after seven more days I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights. Isn't it interesting? In seven more days, you see God is giving people time to repent before Noah gets on the boat, the door is shut, and the floodwaters begin to come. And so God is showing his mercy here. He's saying in seven more days. And by the way, the number 40 is symbolic in the Bible. It rained 40 days and 40 nights, but as we're going to see later on, Noah was actually on the boat 371 days. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. 40 in the Bible is a symbolic number for testing. The Israelites wandered in the wilderness how long? 40 years. Jesus went into the wilderness and was tempted by the devil how long? 40 days. You see, 40 is a number of testing in the Bible. And so here, he's going to send rain upon the earth. And notice what it says here. It says, and I will blot out from the face of the land, verse 4, every living thing that I have made. And in verse 5, Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Again, his obedience there is shown. And in verse 6, now Noah was 600 years old when the flood of water came upon the earth. Now, if you're a young earth creationist and you believe that the earth is anywhere from six to 10,000 years old, if you look at the genealogy of Genesis chapter 5 and you look at Noah's age here, young earth creationists believe that the earth at this point is only 1,656 years old. And the question that naturally comes, if Noah was 600 years old, how many people were on the earth when the flood came? I watched a video last night on YouTube, and this guy did all these graphs trying to explain. He had to make certain assumptions, but when he graphed it all up, he said basically there were probably millions of people on the earth, maybe billions, but he said more than likely it was probably in the low millions as to how many people were on this earth when the flood came. And so it says in verse 7, then Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood. Now you got to understand, before Noah uh, built the ark and before he actually entered the ark, Noah actually spent time preaching, no doubt. He didn't spend all of his time preaching because he had to supervise this. We don't know if how much he was involved in it, his sons, but no doubt about it, they were heavily involved in building the ark. But Noah was probably preaching because you can imagine people were coming up to him because up to this point, it had never rained. And so when they asked Noah, Noah, what are you building there, buddy? Uh, I'm building an ark. I'm building a boat. Why are you building a boat? Because it's going to rain and God's going to destroy the earth. You can imagine what people's response was. They probably were laughing at him. They were criticizing him. But you know what Moses, uh, Noah was doing rather? It says in the Bible that he was a preacher of righteousness. Listen to what 2 Peter chapter 2 says. 
If he, that is God, did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Noah was a preacher. We don't know how much he preached. We don't know how much he warned people, but we know that he preached and he warned people. And I'm sure he felt all alone. And you know, you and I, we're living in an evil time right now, and we are called to preach the gospel and to warn people. Listen, the gospel is not only good news, the gospel is also bad news. And before you present the good news, you got to present the what? The bad news. You guys ever heard of the good news, bad news hotel? You never heard of the good news, bad news hotel? The good news is they changed the sheets. The bad news is they switch them from room to room. That's the bad news. That's gross, isn't it? Now look at this quote up on the screen here. I love this quote as we close. Look what he says here. We are living in the days of Noah today. We see such parallels as the multiplication of people in the population explosion. Moral corruption of every kind, just like in Noah's day, violence, the expansion of arts and industry, we see that in Genesis chapter 4 under Cain, and true believers being in a minority, just like Noah. But keep in mind that the days of Noah were also days of what? Witness. In fact, God had told Enoch that judgment was coming, and he warned the people, according to the book of Jude, end quote. You see, we're living in the days of Noah today. We see violence, we see corruption, we see things getting worse and worse in our culture, and you know what you and I have a responsibility to do to share the message of Christ? We need to offer hope. And you know what Noah did? There's no doubt he offered hope. If people would have repented, do you think God would have let them on the boat? Probably he would have, because God is a God of mercy. But no one repented in Noah's day. And there are times we get discouraged because we preach the gospel to people and it seems like more and more people turn away from God and they're not interested. In fact, Jesus said before he comes back, will he even find faith on the earth? And so in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says in the latter times, things are going to grow worse. Corruption is going to get worse. And you know what God wants us to do? He wants us to give the message of hope to people. But listen, with the message of hope, comes a message of warning. We have to warn people that if they reject Jesus Christ, there is going to be a consequence. We are being derelict in our duty if we don't warn people of the impending judgment that is to come. But listen, with any impending judgment, there is always the good news. You got the bad news, but you got to present the good news. The good news is that Jesus Christ is our ark. And if we enter the ark of Jesus Christ, we will be saved from the floodwaters of judgment. That's the only way, is through Jesus Christ. And so, I want to encourage you, each one reach one. Who have you shared with in the last year? Be intentional about sharing your faith with other people. People are willing to listen if you're willing to share. Well, we'll end with verses 8 and 9. It says here, of the clean animals and animals that are not clean, and birds and everything that creeps on the ground, there went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. Isn't it interesting that Noah didn't have to corral the animals? The animals were brought to Noah. And so when God guides us, you know what the Bible says? God takes care of us. He provides for us. See, Noah had to do his part. God was going to bring the floodwaters and Noah had a responsibility, but God provided for Noah what he needed in order to survive the judgment that was to come. And listen, as you serve God and as I serve God, God promises that he will take care of us. He will meet our needs if we seek first the kingdom of God. And so here's the question tonight. Are you seeking first the kingdom? You say, Mike, it's a struggle. It is a struggle. It's a battle. We face the world, the flesh, and the devil. There's this constant pull. But listen to me carefully. Make sure that Jesus is the center and circumference of your life. Don't lose your focus. 
We are living in the days of Noah. And you know what Jesus said in Matthew 24? He said, just like in the days of Noah, people were eating and drinking, they were marrying, and all of a sudden, judgment came. And he said, so it will be before I come back. People are going to be eating and drinking and getting married, and they're going to be doing all these things. But listen, Christians, we have to stay focused on our mission and our call. And so I want to encourage you, don't be a lukewarm Christian this evening. If you're just coasting, ask God to light a fire in your heart. I got to ask God to light a fire in my heart as well, because I want to keep my focus. I want to keep my passion. I want to keep my zeal for Jesus Christ. And you know what God wants? God wants a group of zealous Christians that are hungry for him, that worship him. They're not perfect. They may fall, but they get back up. But you know what? Jesus is the focus of their life. They're seeking first the kingdom of God, and they're spreading the good news, and they're making disciples, and they're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're giving their resources to the kingdom. Listen, that's what God wants. Are you that type of person? And you know what? If you love Jesus, no one has to pressure you to do that. Yeah, you need encouragement. I need encouragement. But listen, it comes down to a love relationship, does it not? If I love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, listen, you don't have to pressure me. I want to serve Jesus. I want to spread the news. You say, but Mike, I can't do that. My personality is not like yours or Pastor John's. Listen, God will use you with your personality. He will use you with your gifts. You don't need to be like anybody else. You're a spiritual snowflake. God wants to use you, but here's the question. Are you available? And are you passionate tonight? Let's pray. Father, thank you this this evening for reminding us that Noah was a man of faith, that he trusted you. And despite the fact that everyone rejected you, you singled him out and you made a covenant with him. And Lord, you've made a covenant with us, the new covenant, and we've been forgiven by your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, As we live in the days of Noah today, we see corruption, we see violence, we see immorality, we see people turning away from you. But Lord, we offer the message of hope. We offer the light of the gospel. God, I pray tonight that we would not be pulled away by the world. God, I pray tonight we would not be lukewarm Christians. We would not settle. But God, we would be on fire for you. We would be like Noah, a preacher of righteousness. God, stir in our hearts tonight a desire for you. And if you're sitting here tonight and you say, Mike, I'm just kind of flat right now spiritually, would you pray right now and ask God to light a fire in your heart? If there's something in your life that God has spoken to you, maybe there's a hindrance. Would you deal with that tonight so that you can continue to grow in your walk with God? God wants serious Christians. God doesn't want lukewarm Christians. He wants people that are devoted to him because in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus said to the church at Laodicea, he said, because you are neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Do you nauseate Jesus tonight because of your lukewarmness? Just pray to him and come to him. He loves you but he wants all of you. Father, we surrender ourselves to you and and Lord, help us to be faithful like Noah. He was a man of perseverance. 120 years, he devoted himself to preach and to build. Lord, may we persevere and may we be faithful to you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. Let's stand tonight. Let's worship our great God.